We've been in the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to go right back there today. So I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles out and turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Starting to read in verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Please pray with me. Abba, I thank you so much for this opportunity to share your word today. Spirit, I ask you right now, spirit that dwells inside of everyone who believes in this place, spirit, I now ask you to come alive in every single person right now. I ask you to remove every scale from every eye. I ask you to unstop every ear. I ask you to remove every bit of dullness around our senses. I ask that you shake us out of our stupors today. I ask that you make our minds sharp. I ask that you take down every wall of rebellion. I pray that you remove everything that would stand between the word of God and the living God and our ears and our being that you right now would tear it down to the ground. You would destroy it. And I ask that you, even now, help your people to hear the word of the Lord. I ask that you would help me as we go forward in the next few minutes. And Lord, we thank you for your word, your beautiful word that's becoming so rich, so real, so genuine, so relevant to our lives today. In Jesus' name, and everyone say, amen. amen. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Of all the beatitudes that we have done and probably will do in the coming weeks, this one is probably going to be the most difficult. And here's why. It's because of the contemporary understanding that we have of ancient words. We've talked about this before. You know, just in talking to people about this beatitude, you know, you say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And they kind of look at you with this blank stare. You know, the way you guys looked at me about two weeks ago? They just kind of look at me like, like that doesn't go together. Most people don't put the word blessed, which is fullness of joy, which is just joy overflowing. That's what blessedness means. They don't put that word blessedness together in the same sentence with righteousness because of the contemporary understanding of the word the way that we understand the word. We understand it from a law perspective. We understand righteousness as uh, something that is put before us as something that we do to obtain something. And we attach the righteousness to a judge and all those other things. And that beautiful ancient word, righteousness, was turned into something very ugly in the 6th century. But today, we are going to roll back the time. We're going to go back before the 6th century, and we're going to look at the beauty of that word, because if you catch the beauty of what Jesus is saying in this particular beatitude, you will never, ever, ever be the same. It's that powerful. So if you recall when we were leading up to doing the Beatitudes, we had a couple of prelude sessions in which we talked about some things that we tried to straighten out before we even got into it. And one of the things we had talked about was this word righteousness. And one of the things that we said was that righteousness is a covenant word. Righteousness is 
a covenant word. Well, Pastor Frank, what does that mean? That means that there are certain words that are uniquely Judeo-Christian words. They didn't come from Webster's Dictionary. These are words that came with the covenant. And covenant is an old, ancient thing that people really understood during the Bible times. They knew what a covenant was. There are more covenant words besides righteousness. The word loving kindness. That's a covenant word. You don't hear people using that word anyplace else because it's a covenant word. Faithfulness is a covenant word. Remember is a covenant word. These words all surround the beautiful idea of covenant. And what covenant is, is, is where this word righteousness comes from. And if we look at it from any other perspective, then we're not going to understand this beatitude. And it's going to go right over our heads and we'll just keep, keep tromping over it. And what we're doing is we are stepping on a beautiful diamond and pushing it down in the dirt in our search for diamonds. And we're not going to do that. We're going to take the time to find out what this word really means. It's a covenant word. Ken, could you put up that covenant slide? Oh, the, not that one, the, uh, the other one, the two for the covenant, please. It can only be rightfully understood through the eyes of covenant. You see, a covenant is, and please, please hear this very carefully. It's very important that we understand this. A covenant is the joining of two parties with an oath who swear upon their lives and swear upon God to be their witness that the terms of this covenant will be brought about even if it kills them. Now, we don't understand covenant a whole lot in this country because we don't have anything to go by. We don't have any oath that's so solemn that we're willing to swear by God that we're going to keep it or we will die. We, we don't do that. We sign contracts, but a contract is in no way what a covenant is. A covenant is an ancient ritual in which a person would literally swear before God and before witnesses that what they were saying they were going to do, they were going to do it even if it kills them. And they had a ritual in which they did that. Tracer, would you help me with this? Uh, don't worry. <laughs> okay, now he's going to stand over here. Now, there was a ritual that they did before they made a covenant. And it was that they would take animals, and they would cut these animals in two. And I know it sounds bloody, but please listen. This is beautiful when you understand what it means. They would take a three-year-old heifer, cut, her, cut the cow in two. They would lay one side on this side and one side on that side. They would take goats. They would cut them. They would lay one side on this side and one side on this side. And then they would take other animals, lambs, and they would cut one side on this side and one side on that side. And what they would do, one member of the covenant party would stand on one side. The other member would stand on the other side. They would cut themselves. Did you hear what I said? They would cut themselves. And as they walked this path of blood, holding their hands in the air to God as their witness, they would swear, walk this way if your hands up. <laughs> they, would, they, they would walk past each other. They would walk this path of blood together. And what they're doing is they are swearing. They're saying, I will keep this covenant even if it kills me, as their blood is mingled with that path of blood in which they're walking in, they're saying to God, I will keep this covenant. I will do exactly what I've said I was going to do, even if it kills me. That's what they were saying when they said that. Praise God. Thank you so much, brother. That's what, they were, that's what a covenant is. Now, this word righteousness comes out of what a covenant is. And when these, when these two parties kept the terms of that covenant, listen to me very closely, when those two parties kept the terms of that covenant, 
they were considered righteous. That's where the idea of righteousness came from. Keeping the terms of that covenant made them righteous. Doing what they said they were going to do, that's what righteousness is. That's where it came from. You remember a few weeks ago we looked at the first time that covenant was mentioned in the Bible in Genesis 15? I'm, I'm going to spot read that and just highlight on a few things. Genesis 15. And if, if you recall, it was, the, it was the covenant that God was making with Abram, Abraham at the time. And he called him outside, and in verse 15 he says, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. Did you, catch, did you get that? Did you get what God said to Abram? They haven't made a covenant or anything, but God has come to him and laid it all out on the table and said, don't worry about anything, Abram. I am your shield. I am your great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Look, you've not given me any offspring. Indeed, one born in my own house is my heir. But the word of the Lord came to Abram and said this. This one will not be your heir. Your heir will come from your own body. Then he brought him outside and said, look, look now towards heaven. Count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit. And he said, Lord, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought all of these things, and he cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds into. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he, he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve there. And they, they will... Afflict them 400 years, and also the nations whom they serve I will judge. Now as for you, you shall go to your father in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the f And it came to pass when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. But wait a minute. Didn't we say that a covenant was between a party of at least two? Shouldn't Abraham have passed through those pieces as well? Well, where was Abraham? He was in a deep sleep. That means that God took it upon himself to fulfill his part of that covenant and Abraham's part as well. Well, if that's the case, what was Abraham's part in that covenant? Well, we find that right there in Genesis 15, 6. It says, and he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Uh, a better translation would be, and he, Abraham, believed in into the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Do you see what happened here, folks? 
during this covenant that God made with Abram, and the only reason God did that was for Abram's own assurance. God didn't do it because he needed the assurance of Abram. Abram needed God's assurance, and that's why he did it, because before he had said anything, God says, I'm your shield. And what he was saying is, I got your back, and everything that I said is going to happen is going to happen. He came to Abram and said that, but he did that. God did that. God took the painstaking time to do that for Abram's assurance. But now, here's God walking through this path of blood. That's what the smoking torch, the torch and the smoking oven was, was God walking through. And he walked through and did his part, but he also did Abram's part. And that means that Abram's part in the covenant was not to necessarily promise God everything that he was going to do. It was to simply trust and believe everything that God had already done. Do, do you hear what I'm saying, folks? Please, no more blank stares. <laughs> Abram's part in this covenant, it wasn't a contract. Where God signs here and Abram signs on the dotted line and, 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 and you know, you better do everything that's, that's here on this contract. And if you don't, then the contract is off. No. God went into this covenant with Abram knowing that he was going to fulfill it himself. Abram's part was to believe, to believe, to believe into what God had done for him already. It says that Abram believed into the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. That word accounted is an, another word that's used is reckoned. You don't hear the word very much, but the word is reckoned. And you know what that word means? It means to give one's own opinion of value or worth. To give one's own opinion of value or, or value a word. So what God said was, Abraham, my opinion of your value is that you are now righteous because you have believed. You see, Abram's belief constituted his righteousness. I'm not making this stuff up. Remember what the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 6, 13 through 19? Verse 13, this is what the writer of Hebrews said. For when God made a promise to Abraham, and he's talking about this whole incident that we just read about in Genesis 15, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. You don't see nothing there about Abraham. You better do your, you know, you better do your part, Abraham, because if not, then, then I'm going to call this whole thing. No, God swore upon himself that he would keep that covenant. You know, let me give you an example. How many parents do we have here? How many grandparents do we have here? Okay, then you can relate to this. Okay. You have a five-year-old grandson or a five-year-old son, and you want to do something really special for him that's going to just change the rest of his life. So you're going to take all your life savings, and you're going to start a business, and you want him to be a part of this. Now, are you going to go to him and say, listen, we're going to, we're going to partner in this business, and... Uh, and I want you to sign here and swear to me that you're going to do everything that you're supposed to do and that you're all into this. Would you do that? No. You know why? Because that child is not capable of keeping that, that, that contract. He doesn't have what it takes. 
Now, what you probably do, you might include them into it, but you would take on the full responsibility of running that business, of making sure that it was profitable and everything else. Why? Because you're doing that more for his benefit than yours. You're not doing that for your benefit. You're doing it for his benefit, and you simply want him to be the benefactor to it. God took both sides of the covenant because Abraham probably couldn't keep it. We know he couldn't keep it because we read the story. We see how one chapter later, he's all over the place. So if that was the case, then God would have said, well, you know what? You broke the covenant. I'm out of here. But no, God took both sides of the covenant. Goes on to say this. It gets better. He could swear by no one greater. He swore by himself saying, surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end to all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it, confirmed it with an oath. And when he confirmed it with this oath, he did it by two immutable things. He did it with an oath. And he did it with a promise, an oath and a promise in which God cannot lie. This God is love. This is the God that says, I cannot lie. I cannot forsake myself. God keeping the covenant is the righteousness of God. So how? Did God do that? How do we know? How do we know that he kept his covenant? How do we know that? It's the gospel. The gospel. Jesus is the gospel. See, righteousness isn't a list of all the things that you have done. Righteousness is Look at what God has done through Jesus. God from God. Jesus was God with a genealogy. Jesus was that seed of the woman who crushed the serpent's head. Jesus was that, that seed of Abraham that we just talked about. Jesus is God inside of our humanity. Jesus is God who cannot lie inside of our humanity with all of our hostility, with all of our rebellion to God. Inside of our humanity, swearing to keep all of his promises to humanity and carries it to death and it died. But then Father raised him from the dead that was a seal of the covenant I will keep this covenant even if it kills me I will keep this covenant even if it kills me and now a human walks out of that tomb a human walks out of that tomb he did it you see, when you look at the cross, see your face on that cross. When you look at that one walking out of the tomb, you see your face walking out of that tomb. See, the, the resurrection was the most cosmic event in all of history, in all of time. It was a recreation of everything. You understand? When, when, when Jesus went down into that tomb, a man and God, and came out of that, nobody had ever done that before. Nobody had ever put away sin and death. 
Nobody had ever trampled on the serpent's head before. But Jesus did that. That was cataclysmic. That changed everything. That was the new creation right there. That was the beginning of the new creation with what he did when he came out of that tomb. And he came out of the tomb. See, Jesus did it all. And when we believe into that, you understand? When we believe into that, then the righteousness that's his becomes ours. We become righteous. Why? Because we now are keeping the covenant. You understand? That's your righteousness, believing into what he has done already. And it's not just mental assent. It's not you sitting there and checking off a box. Do you believe in the resurrection? Check. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Check. No. It's not mental assent. This is real, folks. This is you. This, this means I lean into that. This means that I put my hope, my time, my dreams, my future, my career, my family, everything. I believe it that must I lean my very life on it. And if it doesn't hold me up, then I will die. That's how much you have to believe in it. That's what it means to believe. I hold nothing back. I have nothing to protect. I take it all and, and, and I lean in and I believe in everything that he's already done for me. That's happened already. We call it the finished work of Christ, but, but that's what he's done already. We lean into that. We believe that. That's what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 1. Can we, can we get that slide? In, in Romans chapter 1, let me read verse 16 and 17 to you. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. This is what he's talking about. He, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Do, do you hear what he's saying there, folks? He's saying that the power of God to save is the gospel of Jesus Christ. How does God save people? Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus went down into a tomb, took you and me with him, but he came out of that tomb alive, and we came out alive with him, and we rose and we ascended with him. That's the good news of the gospel. That's how God saves people. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what Paul is saying here, he's saying, He's saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. And then he says, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed how? In the gospel. The righteousness is revealed in the gospel. And it goes on to say, from faith to faith, as, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. He's saying that this good news of what Jesus has already did is in the righteousness of God revealed. That word revealed, that's a beautiful word. It's the word apocalypto. And you know what it means? It means to remove a cover or to expose something. To remove a cover, and to expose what was hidden. You understand? The righteousness of God revealed means 
that righteousness was there, but now as it's being revealed to you, the cover's being pulled off and what was hidden is now being exposed and, and it's no longer hidden. It's right there for you to see. That's what it's saying. It's, 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 it's almost, imagine a beautiful wedding and the groom is standing there and this beautiful bride comes in and this bride, it's the same idea, this bride has a veil over her face. But then comes the moment when the veil is pulled off and the beauty of who she is is revealed. You see, that's what this, that's what this word really means. That's, that's, that's the same taste that this word has. The fact that the gospel, the righteousness of God was there, but now it's being revealed. And he goes on to say from faith to faith. Now, let me ask you a question. Where does revelation come from? Do you and I just, just like have the ability to give out revelation? No. Revelation has to come from God. Do you understand? So the revealer of the righteousness of God has to be God himself. It says, it says from faith to faith, and I've heard, I've heard different people say, well, that's, that's just Paul using an intensive form. He's just talking about faith. No, he isn't. Paul is saying from someplace to something else. You see, it's not like uh, when Solomon says vanity of vanities. Now that, you're, you're just trying to build on a word or you say holy of holies. Okay, now you're just you're building on words. But Paul is talking about from faith to faith, which means it came from some place and it's going to some place. There's two Greek words that's, that's used there. The word ek, which means out of, and ice, which means a motion or a direction towards. So it's being revealed, or the revelation is coming from faith to faith. So it's saying that the same thing is coming out of someone and going in the direction of someone else. Righteousness com coming from him and going to you. Do you get that? His righteousness coming from him and into you, faith to faith. He, he is faith, the faithful to your faith, being revealed faith to faith, from faith to faith. That's what he's saying. Then he goes on to say this, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You know what that word just is? It's the same word righteous. So what Paul is saying is the righteous, who is you and me, the righteous, the ones that are in covenant with God, the righteous, why are we in covenant with God? Because we believe. We believe that he is faithful to his word, and when he swore upon himself that he would keep that covenant, I believe it with all my heart. I lean everything that I am into it. And if it's not true, then I'm going to fall. But I'm still standing because it is true. The faithful one, we believe into him, from him to you, and we believe it. So it is said, the righteous shall live by faith. Whose faith? God's faith that came from him to you. Do you understand that? God's righteousness that came from him to you is now your righteousness. Your righteousness. That's right. Your righteousness. And we believe. That's what we do. We believe into it. That is why we have a radical change of mind. Radical change of mind. Uh, religion uses the word repent, but they have so messed that word up that repent means nothing but be, like be sorry at the altar. That's all it means, and that's not what the word means. Metanoia is a powerful word, and it means a radical change of mind. That means that whatever I used to think about God, I don't want anything to do with it anymore. That means if I had a wrong view of God, 
I repel it away from me because it's not the truth. And I've seen the real God. You see, that word repent comes, if you could imagine Jesus himself standing in front of you and all of a sudden you realize everything that he's done for you. That's what metanoia means, a radical change of mind. Oh, my God, you are God from God. You did all this stuff for me, and it's done already, and all I have to do is believe into you. That's what a radical change of mind is. So, yes, that's what I do. I believe and I repent. I believe and I have a radical change of mind. Or better yet, I have a radical exchange of mind. That means that I change this mind with all of its biases, with all of its wrong teaching, with all of its garbage, with all of its weight. I change, I exchange that mind for a brand new mind, a mind in which I can really understand what God has done for me, when I can really believe him because I know he's trustworthy. I don't have to worry if I'm going to stand or fall because I'm going to stand because he stands. I now rest my entire being on the fact that he did it. I now begin to awake to a whole new world. I begin to see things so differently. It's almost like, and some of you can identify, it's almost like falling in love. You know, you fall in love and, and, and all of a sudden, Everything looks different. It, it, anybody know what I'm talking about? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> but, 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 but if you haven't ever fallen in love, let, let me explain it to you. Okay. Uh, everything looks, I mean, you wake up the next day and it's like the same thing, the same street looks beautiful. You know, the, 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 the flower, you see flowers and birds and, and everything is beautiful. You see everything so differently. Well, 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 that's what happens as you believe into Christ. All of a sudden, you, 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 you start seeing everything so differently. You, you, you see things that maybe you didn't like before, and all of a sudden, you see the beauty in them. And you, you, you begin to, like, change, and you begin to awake. But now, as you begin to awake, something else is happening inside of you, too, because you can't be in two places. As you begin to awake there's something inside of you that begins to die also. You see, as you begin to awake, you can't be awake and sleep at the same time. So as you begin to awake, all that inner hostility that you used to have about the things of God, all that stuff begins to just wither up and die. All that bitterness that used to carry around towards people begins to wither up and die. That, 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 that hatred that you may have carried for years about something that happened in your life, all of a sudden, that stuff begins to just wither up and die because there's no more place for it. You see, Jesus carried all that stuff to death. It's dead. You, you understand? It's dead. It's not there anymore. You don't have to carry it anymore. And as you begin to wake up, all that stuff begins to die, begins to fall. You truly start becoming the brand new creation that God said you were going to be that he promised you were going to be, that he swore on earth, on oath, that he would do for you. He said, I swear by myself that everything that I said is going to happen, and if it don't, that I cease to be God, and the, the, the entire creation will collapse within itself. And guess what? The creation is still here. The creation ain't going nowhere until he says it does. What he did for you and as you, is now yours. What he did for you and as you is now yours. It's yours. He's done it, and it's yours. You see, you believe into that. And that's where we get our righteousness from, folks. Now, I know it took me a long time to get here, but what I'm trying to do is to dislodge some of those wrong ideas that have been poured into us from from. from everything from the church to, to society to everything else, we, we need to throw that out, folks. It's not the true biblical righteousness. And we need to hear what God is saying about his righteousness and what he's done for you and what he's given you. 
But you see, that verse goes on to say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What's that all about? See, let me tell you something. In this country, we have no idea what it is to hunger and thirst. We have no idea. And, and so there, are other, there are people here that may have come from other places, and they will tell you. So you, you, you Americans, you have no idea what it is to be hungry. You have no idea to be what it is, what it is to be thirsty. You see, we're hungry if we had like a, if we had a, a, an early breakfast and it's not lunch yet. You know, it's, oh, man, oh, I'm hungry. I, I, I got to get something. I got to get a snack or something because I'm hungry. I, 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 you know, I must have ate too early or something. That's not hunger. That's not hunger. That's not thirsting. Let me tell you, uh, there are places in the world, and this is no joke, but there are places in the world where there are people, real human, precious human beings, that have to walk eight hours to get water. One family member goes out and walks four hours to get to a well to carry a five-gallon bucket of water back for that whole family. They have to cook with it. They have to wash with it. They have to clean with it. Let me tell you, that's thirsting, okay? That's thirst. We don't know what thirsting is. We don't know what hunger is. But hunger and thirsting is something that God gave us. You see, when he put Adam in the garden and he made all these beautiful, luscious trees with all of this beautiful fruit on it, it wouldn't have done any good if Adam didn't have the capacity to want it. And God put that hunger inside of Adam so that Adam would long for something, and when he longed for it, he would have it, and he would eat it, and he would be satisfied. You understand that cycle? So hunger is not always a bad thing. Hunger simply means that you're wanting something that, 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 that isn't in here. There's something that you need to get from here to get in here to be satisfied. That's what hunger is all about. And, and, and many of us know that you can be hungry, but if you eat the wrong thing, it doesn't matter. You can be hungry, and, and if you eat McDonald's, then, you know, in an hour or two, the hunger comes back again because you didn't eat anything. You didn't eat real food. You ate something that, that for the moment, I mean, when you stand there and, and you look at those big screen TVs and the Big Mac is floating up and down and yeah. it's on the grill and it's, and it's like, wow, that looks so good. I, I'll take two, you know, and, and, and you eat it. But then, you, you know what I'm talking about, D. And then, <laughs> but then an hour later, you know, you got to eat it again. And then an hour later, you got to eat it. So, 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 so real hunger gives you a desire for real food. You see, when you eat real food, you will be satisfied. When you eat a good meal of real, nutritious food, then, 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 then you're satisfied. So that hunger is something that God gave you. God gave you the ability to be hungry so that you would find something that would satisfy you, so that you would find good food to satisfy you. You know, in uh, Isaiah 55, listen to what Isaiah says. Isaiah 55, and it's called The Invitation to the Thirsty. Listen to this. He says, come. All of you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Now, we don't understand what he's saying because we're not in the Middle Eastern culture in Bible times. But in that culture, everybody knew what that meant. You see, when we celebrate a birthday here, then we expect presents, right? You have a birthday? You know, give me a present because I, I made another year. But 
during these times, the people were so thankful to God that they made another year. Here's what they would do. If a person came up, say, on a birthday or an anniversary or something, they would go to the marketplace. They had these big outdoor marketplaces. And they would go over to, to uh, one of the stands, and they would purchase everything in that stand. And they would stand by. And th now the merchant, he would start saying, come, buy with no money. Come, eat, drink, buy with no money. And they knew exactly what that meant. You see, that person was showing their gratitude to God for another year by feeding other people. And what would happen, people would come around and, and they would get what they needed from the stand and they would, they would humbly thank the man or the woman or the person that, that was doing it because they didn't have to buy that. But it also attracted another group of people and these were the people who really didn't have any money. These were the people that, could, that, that were hungry probably and thirsty, but they didn't have anything to buy this food with. So when they came along and they heard, come, Buy with no money, buy milk, buy, buy fruit, buy bread with no money. When they heard that, and they realized that what they needed, what they needed was, bit, was right there, and it wasn't going to cost them anything because they didn't have anything anyway, then they would come over and they would, they, they, they would get the food. They would get the milk. They would get the, the water. They would, they would get the bread, and they would be so thankful. They would be so, so thankful. Why? Because now they just got something that they didn't have, and they got it, and it didn't cost them, and they realized, wow, and they became so grateful. You see, righteousness is something that you can't buy with money, but it's something that you can really be grateful for. Please stand with me.